hello, hello. Oh, hi. <laughs> and welcome to Gilded Gauze, the place to get your sordid tales from the Gilded Age. From scandals to crime, to spooky mysteries. It's episode three and you're back. Or perhaps you've just arrived and thank you for being here. Thanks for hanging out with us. I'm Diana Palmer. And it's me, Justin Palmer, your mistress of mayhem. I think I said that once before. <laughs> Today's episode has it all. We have scandal. Crime. A pasta poltergeist. That's that's my favorite part. We've checked all the boxes. And it's kind of a heavy episode. It's this is definitely a true crime episode. It's the best way to start a podcast is to let people know. It's going to be a downer this time. Yeah, it's one of the biggest scandals, though, from the era. Right. So the story must be told. Yeah. And real quick. Need to issue a trigger warning for this episode. There is mention of abuse, sexual assault, and violence. And we don't get into too much detail, but it is just unfortunately part of the story. So please feel free to skip ahead to the spooky spaghetti portion of the episode. Spaghetti is so spooky. The sources for this episode are the book Saving Sin City by Mary Cummings. The article The Love Triangle That Led to Murder in Madison Square Garden by Allison McNearney. And the rest of the sources you can find in our show notes. So, here we go. Onward. It was the evening of June 25th, 1906. And the summer heat settled on New York City like a sweltering blanket. New York and heat, to me, sounds like a bad time. I've heard a lot of people talk about how stinky it gets there during the summer. And while it was common this time of year for the money to leet to flee to their mansions on the beach, like, say, Newport... 1,000 posh New Yorkers gathered atop Madison Square Garden, the second of its four iterations, for the Rooftop Theater's grand inaugural performance of Mamselle Champagne. The show was a flop by all accounts, and not even because of what happened next. In an act that would leave the audience shocked and confused, one man stood, aimed a pistol, and shot another man three times, killing him before a sea of horrified spectators. And as the killer was being escorted out by police, he turns to the crowd and says, I did it because he ruined my wife. <laughs> Some accounts say he stood over him and said that. Some say it was while he was being escorted out. I feel like that was just his PR team trying to get people to make it sound cooler than it actually was. The murder of famed architect Stanford White would end up one of the most infamous crimes in subsequent trials of the century. Just like uh, the more modern trials of like O.J. Simpson or Casey Anthony, the nation was glued to the story as the sordid details and secrets were splashed across the headlines of daily newspapers. It's interesting to think about people being glued to a story when it's in newspapers instead of on TV. But yeah, I guess that's just how it was then. But this wasn't the usual murder case because we already knew the answer to the biggest question in a crime like this, the who done it. Hundreds of witnesses watched Harry Kendall Thaw shoot and kill Stanford White. But many questions remained. Like, why? And like, <laughs> how come? And like, I think those are the same questions. Like, how had a man as prominent as Stanford White ruined Thaw's wife? Was there a hidden, unsavory side to White? Was Thaw a man in a fit of murderous rage, or was it an act of insanity, as he would claim during the trial? So let's get to know Stanford White. He was the most famous architect in New York City. His designs remain iconic fixtures of the cityscape even to this day. His clients and friends were among the most elite in the country. He designed the Washington Square Arch, which is, you know, famous scene in When Harry Met Sally. They get out of the car. They decide they're not going to be friends and they go on to live their lives. Never to meet again. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what happened. He designed the Metropolitan Club, the Madison Avenue mansion of J.P. Morgan, which is now the Morgan Library, the Vanderbilt mansion in Hyde Park, even the second version of Madison Square Garden, the setting of his eventual murder. Author Richard Guy Wilson once said, White loved to create theatrical buildings with lavish ornament and interiors where important events could cause commotion. Theatrical building sounds like a building that does theater. By day, White was the picture of a Manhattan gentleman. But a life of debauchery and sexual exploitation lurked beneath this carefully crafted facade. 
And he was able to conceal his sexual predation behind this guise of being this respectable married man. Gross. After marrying 22-year-old, well-pedigreed Elizabeth Spring Smith in 1884, the couple went on a six-month honeymoon in Europe and in the Northeast. But once they were back home in New York, White soon, as Wilson put it, quote, found the attractions of money in the flesh were irresistible. I just can't, I can't control myself around <laughs> this money and flesh. White preyed on young girls looking to make it big in showbiz. And he groomed these girls and had secret orgies at his secondary Manhattan apartment that had multiple stories and a rear entrance on 24th Street. It had red velvet curtains and it expensive art. And one of the rooms had a red velvet swing suspended from the ceiling with ivy twined ropes. And another room was covered in mirrors. His appetite for aspiring starlets led him to the beautiful and very young Evelyn Nesbitt. After moving to NYC from Pennsylvania at 15, Evelyn worked as a model and showgirl and lived in a boarding house with her mom. But she dreamed of being an actress. Her charming good looks got her a lot of attention. And she soon caught the eye of that bastard Sanford White. That bastard! She met the 47-year-old White at a dinner party and had a good impression of him, apparently. Evelyn's mother gave White permission to have a, quote, caretaking relationship with the 16-year-old, with her 16-year-old daughter. He would help her build her career and get established in society. Totally normal, right? Yeah, no, I, I feel like that's like a big mistake. You just you don't usually give adult people... Uh that kind of access to your kid. Evelyn said in her 1914 autobiography that, quote, My first experience with Mr. White was that he was very unprepossessing, that he was very kindly, and that he was safe. He did not treat me with any great ceremony, but he was courteous, attentive, and took an interest in my life. So we took her to the, <laughs> he took her to the dentist to fix her teeth. That was like a first order of business. And that's the first thing a dad does when they get a new um, kid. They take him to the dentist. He, uh... Well, he um, he had a thing for teeth. So uh, then he moved her and her mother from the boarding house into the hotel and supplied her with a generous weekly allowance of $25. How much? How much is that now, do you think? It's um, uh, it's $5,000 a week. Uh, close. 907 That's not. So at the time, that was pretty, that was pretty generous. It wasn't close. He also plied her with expensive gifts like the fine jewelry and furs he gifted her on her 17th birthday which is also christmas day and over the course of many visits she grew more comfortable with him it will later be revealed during the trial that early in their acquaintance white invited teenage evelyn to his apartment for a dinner party only when she arrived there was just the two of them he provided her with champagne and urged her to drink up and as she later testified in court, the next thing she could recall was waking up in bed with him, and she was completely naked. Ugh, and it's, like, really awful. And she never labeled it as such, but it was, like, pretty clear to everyone that Stamford White had drugged and sexually assaulted her. It was also clear to the man who would become her husband, Terry Thaw. Evelyn's career continued to thrive, and she eventually ended her coercive relationship with White but she would not fare better with the man she would marry five years later. Harry Thaw was from a wealthy Pittsburgh family whose fortune is traced back to his father's acquisition of Pennsylvania railroad bonds. So it sounds like she may have found someone who ca will care for her and yeah. treat her well. That's exciting. Yeah, we'll see. And he was the black sheep of the family. Uh, oh, no. Fearing his ill-tempered, bug-eyed son would squander his fortune, his father wrote strict limits on Harry's income into his will. <laughs> limits that his proud and pious mother would blow to smithereens. Lo and behold, once his father passed away, she raised Harry's annual allowance from $2,500 to a whopping $80,000. Mommy, I need more money. <laughs> but that wasn't enough. His insatiable appetite for the high life would burn through that as well. Harry was sadistic and abusive, and he relied on family money to pay off his victims. Ugh. Gross. After getting kicked out of Harvard for, quote, immoral practices, he traveled around Europe for years, he hosted lavish parties, and his indulgence in debauchery gave him a seedy reputation. He returned home and set his sights on entering New York society, 
And his mom was his biggest cheerleader. She thought everyone would love him. Yeah, I, I bet that didn't end up being true. <laughs> he, and he found it easy to buy his way to society's top tier. Mrs. Astor even invited him to one of her famous balls. But good old Harry, his reputation followed him. You want to be my friend? Here's $500. <laughs> and it didn't help that he would boast about and regale his friends with tales of his questionable escapades, like the time he purposely crashed his car into a shop window to punish an imprudent salesperson. Ugh. He was truly a spoiled, petulant little rat <laughs> with an evil streak. Yeah, she's Louise. More tales of his ill deeds began to tri- trickle out, exposing his troubling behavior, like an incident in which he flogged a hotel employee and then proceeded to pour salt in their wounds. He's like a, he's like a storybook villain or something. Yeah, he really is. Jeez. And another story came out about his fondness for whipping girls at a West Side brothel. His perverse predilections were no longer secret, and he was soon shut out from New York society. He was kicked out of all his very beloved highfalutin clubs. He remained entitled, and he didn't recognize that his own behavior led to the humiliation he was experiencing by being shunned by his peers. I can't believe these people don't like me. What's not to like about me? In fact, he was convinced that he was being blackballed and maligned by certain old moneyed members of society. And he felt like they were no better than he was, so he thought it was, like, totally unfair. Which, yeah. granted, Stanford, Stanford White was, like, wasn't <laughs> any better than he was. Yeah, that's for sure. I feel like this guy, he exhibits a lot of um, narcissistic personality traits. Yeah, and that's probably why he held one person more than all others responsible for his downfall, Stanford White. Yay, the the two bad people can be angry at each other, maybe. And Harry was envious of White's popularity and his success, and he resented him for it. I can't believe this accomplished. (laughs) Architect is getting attention. (laughs) Harry's hatred for Stanford White actually blossomed long before Harry had even met and become enthralled with Evelyn. He was invested in taking Stanford White down. The malignant seed was planted shortly after Harry arrived in New York when he made a fool of the wrong person. He made a fool of Santa Claus. (laughs) Yeah, that was it. As the new guy in town, he was able to persuade friends of Frances Belmont, she was a member of the Broadway show Evelyn was a part of, to bring some of her theater friends to a party he was throwing. He was like, it's a great networking opportunity, I'm going to meet all the people. This is how it actually sounded. All the girls are coming to my party. But a night before the party, Harry was due to meet Francis for dinner at the nice restaurant Sherry's. But he didn't want his society friends to see him out with her, so he stood her up. So, furious, Francis got her revenge on the old boob. (laughs) Instead of going to Harry's party, she gathered her friends and went to Stanford White's apartment for, quote, an evening of spiteful merriment. Oh, snap. Those sound like, I mean, sound like the best kind of evenings. Heck yeah, man. Spiteful merriment. Absolutely. And his humiliation was made public with a town topics headline. Floridora beauties sing for their supper in White Studio while Far Orchestra fiddles to an empty room at Sherry's. (laughs) Which, of course, left Harry enraged and he blamed White for ruining his party. That's a super burn and an excellent one. Yeah. And I love it. He vowed to hold him responsible for everything that had gone wrong in his life. Boy, did he. Ugh. At the time, Evelyn was a member of the Floridora Sextet on Broadway, which was known for its risque dancing and allure. I guess kind of burlesque Yeah. And she gets a flood of flowers and love letters after every show. But some of the letters stood out. And driven by his fixation to steal her from White, Harry is her most persistent fan. He would eventually send her invitation after invitation to lunch accompanied by red roses with a $50 bill wrapped around them. Here's $50. Come to lunch with me. (laughs) But the invitations were actually sent anonymously. So she showed up just to see who was sending her such well-written love letters. And she is shocked to learn that her secret admirer is Playboy Harry (laughs) Thaw. Their first meeting did not go well, as Mary Cummings says in her book, Saving Sin City, quote, 
Thaw's eccentric manner, rapid speech, and oyster eyes unnerve Evelyn. Hey, watch me eat all these as fast as I can. Watch this. Look over here. Hey, can you look at these shoes? These shoes are Italian leather. Mm, they're so nice. Aww. Harry backed off, but he continued to send her gifts. Ever vigilant. And it was four years later when Harry was 34 and Evelyn was just 20 that he was able to woo her while on his best behavior. No! And they wed in 1905. I can't believe he was successful in this and it makes me sad that he was. Uh, do you think maybe she was just like, I don't know, getting older and trying to figure out how to settle her life down? Maybe. Perhaps. But once he put a ring on it, his true sadistic nature was revealed. And it was believed that he whipped her and sexually abused her. Ugh. So, poor Evelyn, she really goes from the frying pan, like, to another frying pan. <laughs> and I guess he thought nothing of his own abuse of his wife, but he could not abide Sandra White's treatment of her. And I'm sure, you know, the resentment he's held for years also played into this. Yeah, for sure. I mean, once he obtains her, it becomes an insult to his ego that Stanford White mistreated her. Which brings us back to that summer night atop Madison Square Garden. When a when a little worm murders a big worm. Yeah. The crowd abuzz with shock and confusion in the aftermath of the shooting. See, some had no idea what happened, and some thought it may have been part of the show. The show was then ended with the announcement. A most unfortunate accident has happened. The management regrets to ask that the audience leave at once in an orderly manner. There is no danger. Only an accident that will prevent a continuance of the performance. Only an accident. Yeah, sure. But Alison McNearney wrote, quote, The story caused an uproar, not just because a man who had so fastidiously protected his reputation was posthumously being exposed in colorful detail for all of this hedonism, it was also that his story of murder and depravity was stoking the moral fires of division between the working and the upper classes. So let's get to the trial. Harry Thaw pleaded insanity, and his first trial ended in a hung jury. Annoying. That's really annoying. <laughs> yeah. But he was tried again two years later, and in those two years, he really ramped up his insanity defense. But the jury surely saw through all of his, but I'm crazy. And they sentenced him to life in prison. And he rotted there and he died um, miserable. Or this tactic proved helpful and he was sentenced to a posh life at an asylum. This makes me want to puke. <laughs> Where he remained for just seven years. Oh my God. <laughs> and, you know, we'll post a picture on our Instagram of him in his cell enjoying an elegant catered meal. I don't even want to look at it. With like a regular bed. No. Yeah. The New York Journal wrote of the scandal. It is not merely a murder. The flash of that pistol lighted up an abyss of moral torpitude. <laughs> <laughs> Vortical. <laughs> torpitude. <laughs> torpitude. Leaving hidden features of powerful, reckless, openly flaunted wealth. Yeah. I mean, I think this is just how it was back then. A lot, right? Like, really, really seedy undercurrents of supposedly... Um, high society and well-to-do people just living their lives of debauchery. Except these guys were particularly nasty. Yeah, they were. Unchecked. <gasps> What's this? A telegram? All the way from 1898? Ah, thank the stars. Let's hear it. Orange, New Jersey. Prayers will be said tomorrow morning in the church of St. Michael the Archangel at Matthew Street in this city to lay a ghost which is driving the Italian residents of White Street, West Orange, into superstitious frenzy. Ghostly rappings, hand clapping, and other supernatural demonstrations have been heard and experienced since Monday in the store and rooms occupied by Frank Petro and family, who keep a grocery store in the end of a big frame tenement house just across the Orange Line. It was in this house that Peter Cristiano was stabbed by Lorenzo Corbo, an old organ grinder, at a New Year's Eve party eight months ago. The neighbors assert the ghostly demonstrations are caused by the restless spirit of the murdered man. Father Diacula, pastor of the Church of St. Michael, was called in last night. He prayed and sprinkled holy water in the rooms where the noises were heard. While he was in the house, 
there were no demonstrations, but as soon as he had left, the family and neighbor of air, the houses were recommended with redoubled frequency and violence. Petro, who is a big, hearty man of intelligent appearance, says he does not believe in ghosts, but does not know what else to think. At midnight last night, he declares he heard a noise as if the front doors of his store, which were fastened with a heavy bar set in staples, had been thrown wide and the bar flung to the floor. He tried to get out of bed to investigate, but was held down by some invisible power, which pressed upon his chest and made it impossible for him to move. The presence remained for an hour, he says. The doors were locked as usual this morning, but a box of macaroni, which had been placed atop a shelf, stood on the floor in the middle of the room, with a handful of long straws lying across the top in the form of a cross. A Times correspondent heard the noises tonight and made a thorough investigation of the rooms and cellar without ascertaining their cause. Samuel Cristiano, a brother of the murdered man, who keeps a saloon on the next block, is convinced that the presence is that of his brother's spirit. He says he went last night into the room where most of the noises are heard and begged the spirit to make itself visible. It did not, but as he rose from his knees after praying, Three unusually loud knocks sounded just under the place where he was standing. Petro and his family say they have not slept for three nights. They went out to stay with friends tonight and intend to move out of the house tomorrow. Tenants in the other end of the house have heard nothing of the noises. Wow! Those ghosts will try anything, won't they? Ghosts love carbs, too. Yeah, I like these spaghetti ghosts a lot. I think you should probably try to be working with them. Clearly, if they can bring the spaghetti out, they might be able to cook the spaghetti. And then guess what? You've got a workforce. You just need to make sure you figure out how to pay them. Yeah. That's it, guys. Yay. Thanks for hanging out with us. You did it. You came, you sat, we talked, and it was fun. Join us next time to hear how the uber wealthy got their jollies. I get all my jollies from... <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to hear from you and we value your feedback. So please contact us at gildedgoss at gmail.com with any comments, corrections, ideas for episodes, whatever. We're open to anything. Yeah. Yeah. Also, go follow us on Instagram at Gilded Goss Podcast for news and details about the episode and pictures, pictures of these crazy characters we're talking about. And if you like the show, share it with your friends, you know, throw it on your uh, social meets or something. <laughs> Until next time, farewell, cabbages. It's time to face the corn. <laughs>